Welcome to today's program titled Vaccination Nation, Federal Contractor Mandate and OSHA Emergency Temporary Standard Update. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write the code down. It will not be reread, and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Brent Clark. You may begin. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone to uh, today's program. We have a we have a lot of content to cover in a fairly short period of time. Uh, we're going to do our best. Uh, we're going to do our best to do that. Um, just to give you a, a preview of today's presenters, I am very lucky to be joined by my two colleagues, uh, Scott Hecker, who is like myself a member of the Workplace Safety and environmental group here at, at Cypherth. We were very lucky to hire uh, Scott away from the Department of Labor. Scott is a former attorney who represented uh, OSHA for, for many years and has great insights into the agency and how it works. And we're lucky to have him now on the employer side. Um, Scott is recently off of testimony before Congress with respect to vaccine mandates and the ETS. Um, I'm also joined today by Kristen McGurn, one of my longtime partners out of the Boston office. Uh, Kristen is uh, in our labor and employment group, and she is the co-chair of our healthcare practice group. And as you'll see, Kristen is going to bring her knowledge and expertise regarding the way COVID vaccine mandates and um, cover healthcare industries in light of last week's announcements. And finally, um, I'm Brent Clark. I'm gonna start off the presentation. I am the co-chair of CIFAR's Workplace Safety and Environmental Group uh, internationally. Um, and I will be starting off with a discussion about the ETS. Um, I am a 35-year uh, OSHA attorney um, and uh, try multiple cases a year um, before various OSHA judges and panels th around the United States. So if we could advance to the first slide, that would be great. Thank you very much. So um, the, the, the program, just to give you an overview today, um, even though we're starting on the ETS, um, Scott will be leading the discussion on the federal contractor mandate and the Safer Federal work, uh, Workforce task, task Force, which is actually a mouthful. Um, and obviously one of the main things that came out of last Thursday's announcements are effective dates for vaccination being January 4th of 2022, but Scott's gonna, uh, Scott's gonna explain some nuances to that and walk you through how the federal contractor mandate interplays both with general industry and with healthcare. Um, as I said, I will be covering the um, ETS, uh, the OSHA uh, emergency temporary standard and cover some of the highlights of that new standard, which have obviously got everyone's attention um, and uh, have made OSHA something that is a common everyday term in many households. And then Kristen will uh, take the final uh, the section and she's gonna talk about among, among other things, you know, healthcare implications with respect to the vaccine mandates in light of the recent CMS change in guidance that came out, also using that January 4th date for as a, as a trigger 
and the December 5th date, which we also see in, in the ETS. As we get into the meat and the, and the specifics, we'll lay out what those specific issues are. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, that would be great. So the, the COVID ETS, um, what, what, do we, what do we have? This is an emergency temporary standard. This is for, for OSHA practitioners like myself. Uh, the, these are ex extraordinary events because we don't see emergency standards. They're exceedingly rare. Um, and, and in general, you can think of pretty much every safety standard that OSHA's promulgated has always followed what we call the, the due process provisions of the Administrative Procedures Act. This is different. This, this did not go through the Administrative Procedures Act. It did not follow that process and it is being issued as, as an emergency. So when is OSHA permitted to, to issue an ETS? Well, the, the OSHA Act itself, dating back to 1970, actually does contain a provision um, that allows OSHA to issue an emergency standard where employees are exposed to, and this is really important language, grave danger. It's right out of the act from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards. And, and for the lawyers who are joining us today, and we will be giving you the, the CLE credit later on, um, that and is important because the statute requires both. Um, and the emergency standard itself that's being proposed is necessary to protect employees from that danger. That will get into issues. I know you're all gonna be very interested to hear about the first, the Fifth Circuit decision and the litigation that's pending. We're gonna work our way through the, the guts of the, the standard a little bit before we get to a discussion of the, the litigation that's pending. But where and when a grave danger exists and the standard is necessary to protect employees, then the, the act permits OSHA to issue a, an emergency temporary standard. It can be valid only for six months, but then subject to some amendments and reissuance. Um, there are, this is federal OSHA. We have 21 state plans out there. And what that simply means is the state is elected under the OSHA Act to run its own OSHA program. Um, I happen to be in Chicago and I can see over to Indiana from my office, I can see across the lake to Michigan. Both of those are what we call state plan states. Um, state plan states must issue something substantially similar to the federal ETS within 30 days. Those of you in Michigan know, hey, wait a second, we're already there. We've got a form of an ETS. But in any event, it's got the third state plans have 30 days to, to issue something substantially similar or risk being uh, having their program taken away by federal OSHA. Um, the, there is also in this landscape a prior ETS, an emergency temporary standard that was issued to healthcare employers. And that came out on June 21st, 2021. And we're, that's, we're deep into enforcement on the healthcare ETS. Um, our, our group and our clients have been subject to multiple COVID inspections under that ETS. So that's another backdrop, but you'll, you will find that this ETS we're talking about today does not cover those same covered entities under the healthcare ETS. So big picture, as I said, we've got a lot of, of action going on in federal courts. Um, the Fifth Circuit, um, a lot of challenges are being filed in multiple different circuits and the ETS requirements were held last Saturday to, to be invalid and enjoined or stayed by the Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Um, and now there is a pending litigation on when that, uh, when, when that ruling will become final or be withdrawn in some way. Um, a nationwide stay was sought. Um, 
and the court's order says we are granting the motion. Um, we'll get to some details on that a little bit later. We're also alerting you folks to there's litigation in multiple other circuit courts of appeals. Um, and that's going to create some or may potentially create some complex issues about forums and which court gets to control and how is this ultimately going to get to decided. If we could, let's dig into the ETS itself on the next slide here. So who's, uh, who's covered? And, and essentially, um, it's 100 or more employees, if, and that's part-time employees, all employees, whether they're remote or whether they work in a, a facility, and it's nationwide. So it's if, if you've got a couple of employees in, in various states all around, but it adds up to 100, you are covered um, by the ETS as, as drafted. The other tricky part of this coverage is the first date you need to look at is November 4th. You got to look back to last week and say, did I have 100 employees at that point in time? And then there is more or less a continuing fluid dynamic count. So let's say you weren't covered, but you peak over for maybe the holidays or because of a spike in business you will then trigger compliance with, with the standard. So it's a somewhat dynamic analysis. Just want to highlight that for folks. So it's not a one-time, one-shot, make, make, make an evaluation. You've got to continue to evaluate it. Um, and again, fully remote workers count. Um, the 100 trigger really doesn't have anything to do with whether they're exposed to COVID or potentially exposed to COVID in a workplace. That's just the trigger that OSHA decided to use. For employers out there, and we have many, that are part of what we call a multi-employer worksite. This is very familiar language to OSHA attorneys. Construction sites are the classic multi-employer worksite where we've got a general and we've got subcontractors of various kinds all working on a common project. The traditional employer contractor rules apply under the ETS. And by that, I mean you count your own employees. You don't count employees of contractors um, who are, if they're truly contractors, and that gets into another nuanced employment issue sometimes. But the, the quick and dirty is your employees even on a multi-employer site, you don't have to accrete or add other employees from other contractors, no matter how closely you work together. Um, what is not covered by the ETS is work sites that are covered by the federal contractor mandate that Scott's going to talk to you about. So if it's an either or, this is a binary choice. You don't have blended work sites under the ETS. I will also tell you some clients have tried to figure out ways to wiggle out of one of the, uh, you know, both. You can't wiggle out of both if you're over 100. One way or another, you're going to get caught by the vaccine, these ma vaccine mandates. They're intended to work in concert with each other. So if you've got somebody working on that project, I suggest you probably slow them down because we're not really likely to get there. The other thing that is not, the other entities that are not in employers who are not covered by the OSHA ETS for general industry are the health care providers who are covered by the previous June health care only ETS. So again, those entities, if they're covered, it's all in and they're covered. Now you could have locations that are covered by federal contractor. You could have a location that's covered by solely by the OSHA ETS. And you could have, a, if you're in the healthcare business or have an arm in the healthcare business, you could have another set of facilities covered by the healthcare ETS and mandate requirements. So it can be complicated. You need to look at coverage. Um, you need to look at coverage by, by the actual operation at the facility. So let's talk about some of these dates if we could move to the next slide quickly. 
Okay, um, December 6th, I want to correct this and, and Scott nod your head. I think per the federal register, this is now agreed upon as December 6th. Are we right on that? Yeah, the, the 6th uh, is, is the compliance date because I believe the 5th is a Sunday. Thank you. And, and so, sorry, but pardon us for that, guys. Uh, we were all calculating based on 30 days, and then we, we had to look at the federal register, which really governs when these things are, are triggered. So what does this ETS really command? Um, you know, the, the big issue, of course, is vaccination. And so we're, we're going to, the, the standard specifically says that an employer must support the vaccination and, and under subparagraph F, basically it, it means you have to mandate that all employees are vaccinated um, and, and have a program in place by December 6th that says the employees are, are going to be vaccinated, but the final date for vaccination will be that January date. Um, and there is an exception, which we will get to in a second, but the default in the standard, and this is very important for especially for OSHA practitioners, the default is it's set up as a vaccine mandate. And then if, if you can meet an exception, you get out of it. Um, what does that mean? Support for vaccination, the standard includes provisions to pay for the vaccines themselves, pay time for people to take off to get the vaccine if they have to leave your work site to become vaccinated. You have to pay sick leave for adverse reactions. At this point in time, I'm going to take a footnote for all of you. In addition to the ETS, OSHA published FAQs, frequently asked questions. You will find in the FAQs the answer to some of the subtle questions that I'm sure are coming to mind. Well, what kind of sick leave? How can I stagger that? What is important? I'll give you a preview. The FAQs are going to tell you you have to, to have reasonable expenses for adverse reactions. Um, but you're going to want to get into all of those issues. And obviously, our team here at Cypherth can help you with all of these nuances if you need it. One of the key elements of the standard is maintaining a vaccine roster. One of the tricks to the vaccine roster is it's not just someone who is vaccinated. You must keep a roster of all employees and identify them as one or the other. So don't get be misled in thinking, oh, I just need to keep a roster of the vaccinated employees. And these documents will need to be produced to OSHA in some rather short timeframes, unfortunately, um, given the standard as it's, it's, it's drafted. There's all kinds of questions about acceptable proof that you, have, you can accept, and the standard actually lays that out for you pretty clearly, what you can accept, and right down to what do I do if somebody's lost their vaccine card. Again, you can consult the FAQs on those kinds of nuanced questions. But the, the bottom line is you've got to, you've got to, you as an employer have a duty to verify and make sure somebody's vaccinated within reason. And I'll put quotes around that. Um, another key component to the standard is if an employee is not fully vaccinated, then they're required to wear a face mask or face covering when indoors um, or when occupying a vehicle with another person. So, so this is, uh, you know, the, the counter to not being vaccinated is um, you're going to have to wear a mask. We could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you very, wait a second. I think, is that a dupe? Or did we go? If we could, uh, oh, I'll just I'll just run through these. No, that's the same slide, isn't it, Scott? I think it is. I think it's a second set of the December sixth requirements. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think if we could advance to the next slide, I think I've covered all the content on this one. All right, here we go. Um, 
So part of that, that verification process here um, is, and remember the Janu January 4th date for sort of the completion of the vaccine shots. So for Pfizer and Moderna, the second shot, the second dose of those would need to be administered on January 4th. As most of you know, the J&J &J is a single dose vaccine. So you technically an employee could be vaccinated with J&J &J on January 4th and still meet the, the requirements of the standard. Now, those of you who understand how all this work will go, but a person's not fully vaccinated on January 4th if they've just gotten their last shot on a two dose or their only shot on J&J. &J. And you're right, you're absolutely right. But the way the standard is set up is January 4th is your date to get that final shot, whichever dose it may be. And then of course we know by CDC guidelines, 14 days later is when you would be considered fully vaccinated. So there's a there's a definitional issue in there. OSHA understands what it's doing, but that's why that that January 4th date is in there. So what do you do if you've got unvaccinated employees under the standard? This is where the testing requirement comes in. So not only must that employee mask, the employee has to be tested at least once every seven days before they return to work. So for somebody who routinely reports to work, then that's gonna be every seven days at least. Um, and for someone who works remotely and they wanna come into work, even for one day, they're required to have been tested seven days before. That's a little bit tricky because that's operationally, that's gonna create some trouble for folks because you're gonna be, you're gonna be stuck. You can't bring your, you have to exclude that person from work. Um, over the counter antigen testing is acceptable. That's one of the good news, one of the few good news pieces in this, in this legislation, or not legislation, but in this standard, because that's the quickie, it's cheaper. That's 15 to 20 minutes results typically. Um, however, if you use the antigen testing method, you may not allow the employee to do that at home or outside of the observation of the employer, unless you've got authorized telehealth proctor. So there's a the good side is you can avoid a molecular test if you, if you want to use the antigen test, but you, you can't let them do it on their own. Um, the testing itself can be unpaid per the ETS, but Kristen and several hundred more of my colleagues in the labor and employment group will tell you this is a very complicated issue under state law, collective bargaining agreements. So uh, before you make a final decision on that, you really need to think this through jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so so what what happened uh, last last weekend? Um, a three judge panel in the Fifth Circuit granted the petitioner's emergency motion to stay the ETS. So that happened on Saturday. Um, this the panel in its remarkably brief order, <laughs> all of a couple of sentences, managed to send a major signal because what the words they used is we, the panel noted we have, there are grave statutory and constitutional issues with the ETS. Those of you too will remember that OSHA's burden is to establish a grave danger. And we don't think this is by any coincidence whatsoever. Um, we think the court is sending a major signal that they don't think the grave, <laughs> um, the grave danger component is met. Also, the haste in which the court entered the order is somewhat indicative of, of at least three judges from that circuit who, who feel pretty strongly on this issue. So what else did the court do? What the court did, so the court says this is state, this is enjoined. 
And then the court set an expedited briefing schedule regarding the petitioners, and that's the sort of employer anti OSHA ETS side of this. That's the petitioners. They set an expedited briefing on a motion for a permanent injunction. So in these kinds of proceedings, you have you can have a temporary, preliminary, and then permanent injunction. And obviously the permanent is permanent. It means till it's appealed and it's over uh, overruled by a higher court, that 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 standards enjoined. So OSHA was required and did submit its response brief last night. Um, we're still digesting the response brief, um, but OSHA put some stuff out over the weekend that's rather predictable. They believe they've met their burden and there is a grave danger and the standard is warranted. Um, petitioners, that's again, the generally speaking, the, the ad opponents of the ETS, they have until today at 5 p.m. Um, you know, you may have heard lingo like rocket docket and other things. This is about as fast as courts ever move um, and a decision could issue promptly. Um, so we've got a situation right now where we just don't know what the Fifth Circuit is going to do um, uh, and how quickly they may rule. We don't know whether other courts are going to jump into this. Um, and let's just take a quick brief look at the next slide. And so I'm going to leave you with one final complex legal issue here. Um, there's something called multi-district litigation. One of the things that could happen is the, 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 Department of, uh, the Department of Justice has already filed to try to get the this, this to be spindled so that it goes into a lottery system and the case is then decided by what other circuit court draws the, the, the number. Um, we don't know whether that's going to happen. I think that date is, is November 16th when the next lottery is for, for MDL. Um, the Fifth Circuit may not wait. And if the Fifth Circuit doesn't wait and they affirm their decision, it's probably likely, this is your best guess as a lawyer, that this would get appealed to the Supreme Court because OSHA is probably not going to wait around to see if they might win the lottery on MDL. So sorry for the haste, and I took more than the time I should have. Sorry about that, Scott. I ate into your time a little bit. <laughs> but um, And please, uh, we will look at your questions, and if we can, answer them as we go. So with that, I'm turning it over to Scott. Thanks, Brent. Um, and just your point, uh, you know, D DOJ's letter uh, requested the MDL lottery for November 16th. Um, the brief, the response brief that was filed yesterday by the government references that as well and indicates um, that the Fifth Circuit should not make any permanent decisions here because of those procedures. Uh, and basically, you know, the main thrust of that argument in the brief is um, this is premature. Uh, a lot of the potential harm is a month out based on the compliance deadlines. And really, uh, it's not time to move on this quite yet. They want the, uh, the MDL process to play out. So now turning though to the um, federal contractor mandate, which actually predates the ETS, uh, though both were announced on September 9th uh, by Executive Order 14042. Um, the contractor mandate uh, directed, or 14042 directed uh, the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force to come up with COVID-19 workplace safety protocols uh, that would need to be followed by uh, federal contractors, covered federal contractors. And I don't believe that the word vaccine or vaccination was actually in that executive order, but I think everyone immediately interpreted it to mean that that's what would happen, uh, especially because Ex Executive Order 14043 mandated uh, vaccines for federal employees. Uh, so here we just have an extension to federal contractors. Um, the, uh, the FAR Council uh, was also then, the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council uh, was then uh, also directed to issue guidance um, and a clause for incorporation into covered contracts by October 8th. Um, interestingly, for the first time potentially in history, and I say that as someone who, who came from the 12 years of government service, they actually issued it a week early on October 1st, 
Uh, I happened to be in the car driving to Asheville, North Carolina. So that was, that was fun to deal with uh, at the time to the unanticipated early release. Um, but uh, the guidance came out and the FAR clause effectively, uh, when it's incorporated into contracts, binds covered contractors uh, to follow the task force guidance. If we go to the next slide, please. We can see some of the key principles. There were three, actually. Um, we hear a lot, a lot, a lot about uh, the vaccination mandate, of course, um, but uh, there are a couple other issues here as well. Um, just one, one distinction, uh, initial distinction between the contractor mandate and OSHA's ETS is that there is no testing option available under the contractor mandate unless uh, it's part of a, a granted accommodation for medical or religious reasons. Um, the second prong here, though, is, uh, you know, compliance with other risk mitigation uh, protocols, including masking and physical distancing. Um, and there is a tie there for vaccinated individuals um, to the CDC's high trans higher substantial transmission location. So there's a distinction about when uh, fully vaccinated individuals might need to wear masks pursuant to the guidance. Um, then the third piece, and really all employers should be, who are covered, covered contractor employers should really be sure that they are designating someone um, to coordinate these efforts, the COVID-19 workplace response efforts required by the contractor mandate and the task force guidance, uh, because if OSHA or whichever agency, it's not OSHA here, sorry, it, you contract with shows up or, or gets wind of, of compliance issues, that will certainly be the person um, that you will want to have be the most knowledgeable uh, and have all the information uh, that an investigating agency uh, will be looking for. Um, and it's just someone who sort of makes sure all the compliance trains are running on time. Um, and it can be, you know, one or more individuals. Uh, but if you already have mitigation protocols in place, um, which hopefully you do, uh, and you have someone designated, you know, this could be something that's added on or, uh, you know, add another person to the team uh, to sort of uh, loop this in. And if we could go to the next slide. I'm going to try and be better at those transitions, Kate. I apologize. Um, whom uh, does the ETS apply, or excuse me, the EO apply to? Um, basically, it does not comply. It does not apply to anyone uh, unless the FAR clause is incorporated into your contract. Um, covered contractors are prime or subs um, that are party to covered contracts, and employees are basically any employee of a covered contractor working on or in connection with a covered contract or at a covered contractor workplace. Um, when it comes to in connection with, that could be sort of overhead positions, and there's examples like HR, billing, and legal. Um, if those folks are either, you know, um, and in addition, affiliated employees who are at a covered workplace will be scoped in too. So if you have those folks um, that are working for the same entity, providing legal advice to the covered contract, um, you know, and execution and performance of that contract, they would be scoped in. Um, also, if you have affiliate companies, employees of affiliate companies working at a covered workplace, the task force has issued subsequent guidance through a FAQ, FAQ saying uh, that those affiliate employees at a covered contractor workplace are also covered. Interestingly, and another distinction uh, with the ETS is that remote, fully remote employees who work on or in connection with covered contracts are subject to the vaccine requirement. They are not subject to masking or physical distancing requirements because their homes are not considered covered workplaces. So the tie that binds there appears to be their work on the contract um, or in connection with the contract. Um, and uh, to some degree, I, I guess, uh, tracks um, CDC recommendations to vaccinate, but to not require distancing or uh, masking when you know, you're playing with your children at home. So uh, covered contractor workplace, again, is any location controlled by a covered contractor at which there's an employee who's working on or in connection with a covered contract. Um, if someone like that is likely to be present during the period of contract performance, then folks working there, that workplace would be covered 
uh, the covered contractor employees and affiliated employees would be um, would be uh, covered by that by that uh, workplace uh, by by working at that workplace. And if we could go to the next slide, I did not do better on the transition, Kate. I apologize. Um, but important dates um, included October 8th, which we talked about, uh, actually issued October 1st. The, the clause that gets incorporated into contracts. Uh, we're at the point where uh, we're almost a month past uh, when they would be, when this clause would be included in new solicitations. Uh, so anyone um, bidding on a contract, you know, bidding on a solicitation at this point would likely know um, that uh, the FAR clause uh, ensuring safety of federal contractors um, will be incorporated in part of that contract going forward. Um, same thing if we're approaching the deadline where by November 14th, uh, the clause will be in any newly entered contract um, by, on or after that date. Um, and Brent mentioned um, the uh, December, I'm sorry, the January 4th vaccination deadline. Uh, that deadline um, is uh, derives from a White House fact sheet that was issued on November 4th. Uh, in, in coordination with announcing the ETS and CMS regulations. Um, I would suggest to you that until we see the task force provide guidance uh, effic effectively and officially adopting that January 4th deadline, we're still looking at December 8th. Um, the task force guidance is what's incorporated into contracts through the FAR clause. And um, if, if you know, that is not part of the task force guidance, that July 4th, get your final dose of whatever your vaccination chosen course is, then I think December 8th is, is still official. Now, hopefully, and if we could move to the next slide, hopefully um, there, that will be addressed. I'm not sure what the drag is from November 4th to now, November 9th, but hopefully we'll see that soon. Um, Contractors must review and approve acceptable documents. These are listed in the guidance, uh, the, uh, each of these documents. Importantly, again, this is another distinction um, between the contractor mandate and the ETS. When it comes to record keeping under the, um, the mandate, the federal contractor mandate, it says show or provide this documentation. Um, so there seems to be an option to not maintain a copy of these uh, designated records. Uh, under the OSHA ETS, it, they're specifically subject to uh, OSHA's um, medical record maintenance requirements, except for the fact, lucky for you, you don't have to keep them 30 years. Uh, you only have to keep them for the life of the ETS. Typically, OSHA requires medical records maintenance for the course of the duration of employment plus 30 years, but they've accepted out uh, the vaccination documentation and testing documentation under the ETS. If we could go to the next slide, um, only to maintain that during the course of the ETS. So we talked about the FAR clause. The council issued that again on October 1st. Um, and it will be, you know, inserted into the contracts as we discussed going forward. Uh, but one sort of um, one sort of quirk of the council's approach here was to uh, basically give discretion to agencies, uh, each individual agency, about how to incorporate the clause and basically what into what documents to incorporate the clause. Um, so uh, some agencies picked up on the strong encouragement from the task force. Uh, to um, go beyond the scope of the executive order. And the FAR Council, in fact, indicated the goal, stated the goal to maximize vaccination. Um, and so uh, a number of agencies picked up on that recommendation to either um, include the clause by through bilateral modification. Again, that means you are supposed to agree to the change. Um, how bilateral it actually is, I think in practice, we've seen um, some heavy handedness from some of the agencies uh, and also um, sort of wide nets cast uh, without a whole lot of guidance in an effort to basically uh, hope that employers won't do too much 
question asking and we'll accept this and, and get it incorporated as broadly as possible. But just because uh, a, an agency reaches out to you, that does not mean you're necessarily covered because again, they're casting a broader net than may be legally required under the authority of the EO. So as Brent mentioned earlier with regard to the ETS, our team here is well-versed uh, both in our uh, safety group and uh, also in our government contracts group uh, to discuss these issues with you and, and speak to you about how you might want to reply to a bilateral modification. Of course, there could be business implications if you aren't a you know, good provider. Um, GSA put it uh, that way in a, I believe, October 13th stakeholder call where they suggested, you know, this is a cover customer service action uh, with the government being your customer. Uh, so customers always right and accept our bilateral mod. Um, but you, you may have options. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to our teams here uh, to discuss further. But again, some of those places where we're seeing that breadth is uh, inclusion in contracts that are solely for products, uh, which were not mentioned in Section 5A uh, of the executive order, which is the applicability section. Um, 5B specifically excluded products, subcontracts solely for products. So uh, we read that order to exclude both prime and subcontracts solely for products, though they have been included in some GSA contracts in the primes and also um, potentially in, in sub strongly encouraged. So something to keep an eye out. Also, uh, those under the significant, excuse me, simplified acquisition threshold, the SAT, um, that's $250,000 typically. Those also were scoped out from coverage on the face of the EO. So uh, if you receive a request on something that's valued beneath that, and that is the value of the contract for the life of that contract, it's not an aggregation of all your contracts with the government. It's one contract, but for the life. So if there are options on it, you'd probably need to take that into account. Um, but anyway, uh, if, um, if we could go to the next slide, uh, just to note that, um, and, and I'm about to pass it to Kristen, but just to note that the FAR uh, regulation, a permanent regulation, um, they allege that they are working on a permanent reg. There is no timetable for that. And the uh, FAR clause that has been issued, the deviations that have been issued by agencies those uh, we expect to be in effect unless and until uh, there is a more permanent standard. Um, so I will kick it over to Kristen for a discussion of the CMS reg as well as accommodations issues. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I'm delighted to be with you all today. And, and for some of you on the call uh, or listening in, watching, you, know, you may fall into a number of buckets here. So you may already be a nursing home subject to the earlier issued um, regulation uh, that governed nursing homes. We've discussed already that there was an ETS issued that covered only healthcare several months back, so that may cover you as a healthcare provider. You may also have federal contracts that require you to pay attention to the executive order that Scott just went through, but also in an effort to cover the landscape uh, more broadly in healthcare and ensure that more people working in the healthcare field receive the vaccine. This CMS issued um, regulations on November 4th, um, like the ETS, sort of akin to the federal um, contractor mandate, uh, but emergency regulations that require additional facilities to get their employees vaccinated, um, starting by uh, having a policy in place by December 5th and um, ensuring that folks are fully vaccinated by that date that Scott mentioned, January 4th. Uh, according to CMS, um, you know, this is going to cover nearly all U.S. healthcare providers, certainly any of those who are uh, relying on Medicare or Medicaid funding, and that is the sort of mechanism by which you'll be monitored. So existing survey and enforcement processes that are in place that you're familiar with will be used to ensure compliance with um, these emergency regulations. And you can expect that conditions of participation will be modified to um, keep an eye on compliance. Um, this means that all eligible staff working in healthcare facilities of all stripes and colors have to be fully vaccinated by that magic date prior to providing care or giving services within you know, the healthcare employer setting. So um, CMS takes the position that this requirement at a federal level preempts any contrary state law and obviously is focused on the industry in which these workers are working and their access to medically vulnerable 
people and the, the visitors who visit them in the in the hospitals and um, you know are really looking to ensure that all staff interacting with one another or with patients or residents in um, you know care facilities uh, or clients, PACE program participants for the elderly, uh, you know, all of those folks, whether they're an administrator or a volunteer or someone actually patient facing, will receive a vaccine. The CMS regulations, you know, observe that there are there can be accommodations for legitimate religious beliefs, observances, and practices, or for recognized medical conditions or contraindications to the vaccine. So says the CMS, the CDC. Um, but there is no testing alternative as an as a as an out from getting the vaccine. So those accommodations um, will be will be drawn, you know, in a small circle. Um, the CMS regulations also require, as Brent got into, reasonable time and paid leave to both receive the vaccine and recover from side effects, you know, just like the ETS that we previously discussed. Um, th this really, what it carves out is those who are performing full-time telework, so people who are 100% remote, have no contact with other workers or patients, um, you know, are carved out, but otherwise it's really, it means everybody in the house facing other staff or working with patients are going to be expected to be vaccinated unless they have a legitimate exemption, um, which requires you to get into the accommodation process and the exemptions that we're about to discuss. So um, some of you have been familiar, I've been working with these accommodation strategies, you know, because you've been subject to other mandates or because as an employer you chose to implement um, a, a mandatory vaccine program as an as a employer. Um, this, as you know, launches you into an analysis of, you know, which kinds of accommodations are you permitted now to um, explore and certainly religious and medical or disability accommodations will be you know a categorical um, or category that you must consider and we'll get into whether you're permitted to consider other categories and which states if the ets is successfully challenged would expect you to you know add other conscience type um, objections or exemptions that you would consider uh, but we'll talk about you know what the what the body of uh, exemption requests can look like and you know what we really are encouraging employers to do now even though the you know the the dates have not yet been hit under the ETS um, or even the CMS which requires you know covered facilities to have a policy in place by December 5th our strong advice is to get moving because we anticipate you know the time is short and we don't know where the challenges in court are going to land, but we, you know, having worked with many clients on setting up these programs, it's, it's not an overnight sort of situation. You really need to work with your leadership to develop an organizational approach to, you know, how you're going to um, evaluate accommodation requests, the workflow process, which we've process mapped out, but by which you will um, undertake these analyses so that they are consistent and careful and lawful and the ways in which you will accommodate, you know, if you are able to grant an exemption, what will that look like and how will those accommodations roll out? Is it an undue hardship to allow unvaccinated persons you know, into the workforce and if so, what happens next? So the systemic or systematic workflow that we would encourage you to be focused on now to you know, achieve compliance with these multiple federal regulations is to, you know, understand how you're going to intake your requests, make sure you're tracking all of the request forms and supplemental material that employees may want to share to support their accommodation request, you know, evaluate whether those packets are complete, whether you need to follow up based on objective evidence that, you know, you lack clarity or there's more information that's required for the company to make a decision. Um, as I mentioned, you know, evaluate for either role by role or as a, you know, company what accommodations are possible? Will remote work continue to be permitted? Is it possible for the people who are requesting the accommodation? You know, obviously in the case of a frontline care worker, patient facing population, you know, remote work is far less accommodatable. And so you need to be going into the, the workflow and the systemic approach to your accommodation process with a clear understanding of what accommodations are going to be permissible and won't create an undue hardship for the organization. Um, the, the way in which you'll communicate your decisions, the timing of those communications, um, and the consequences for uh, granting or denying accommodations all need to be considered. Um, 
as we discussed, you know, the, the, the typical categories under certainly the CMS emergency regulation and under the ETS will be uh, medical or disability and religious accommodations. Um, you know, really what this, what this means is for those of you who are large employers subject to the ETS, a government contractor or receiving Medicaid or Medicare funding, these are your buckets. These are the, um, the, the government, federal government expects that these are the nature of accommodations that you'll consider when an employee requests an exemption from the vaccine. And, you know, on the medical uh, and disability side, really what that boils down to is a typical ADA kind of analysis. Are you dealing with a qualified disabled person who, with or without an accommodation, could perform the essential functions of their role? Um, you know, if so, what might that accommodation be? And is there a, a contraindication to the work rule that is the vaccine mandate? And the CDC has drawn a very small circle around what those contraindications are. Uh, but that is what employers are really focused on when evaluating medical and disability uh, types of exemption requests from employees. CDC is very focused on severe allergic reactions to components within the vaccines, and the vaccines have different components. So one might be allergic to a particular vaccine, let's say J&J, &J, but not the MRM RNA vaccine. So um, there is some interactive process that is built up around evaluating the nature of those uh, exemption requests. The CDC also, you know, has taken a position on autoimmune diseases and whether um, certain people with certain types of autoimmune diseases should take or not take the vaccine, you know, emphasizing as you likely have read, um, their view that getting the vaccine is in most cases um, indicated. Uh, and that is also true for pregnant women, um, people who are breastfeeding or those trying to conceive. And that CDC guidance changed really midstream just a little while ago, uh, where a CDC had previously said, you know, of course, work with your doctor. But, um, you know, pregnant people were advised earlier on um, more frequently to avoid the vaccine. Now the CDC has come out strongly in favor of pregnant people also and breastfeeding people. Um, to getting the vaccine. So there are limited categories that the CDC would advise employers to explore when evaluating medical and disability related exemptions. Um, and then on the religious side, you know, a different um, standard altogether. So the standard for evaluating whether a particular accommodation like allowing unvaccinated people into the workplace would pose an undue hardship on the organization is a smaller burden on the title, not the Title VII side of the house. So the ADA has a higher legal threshold for employers to establish undue hardship. The, the burden is smaller on the religious accommodation side. Um, but, but what we mean when we say accommodating a religious um, exemption request is an employee who has both a sincerely held and religious belief or practice or observance that conflicts with getting the vaccination. And this covers more than just the traditional religions that you've heard about, but also unfamiliar, um, not well um, populated, you know, um, moral and ethical sort of personal beliefs um, in some contexts where it is established that they are both sincerely held and adhered to consistently and otherwise meet the um, requirements or criteria set for employers to comply with Title VII in this context. Um, here, employers also um, need to explore whether it's an undue hardship to accommodate uh, an unvaccinated person in the workforce who has requested a religious exemption. And as I mentioned, you know, that's really a de minimis cost or burden. It doesn't mean only a financial cost like testing, um, but it could also mean com compromising workplace safety or um, workplace efficiency, productivity um, based on um, you know, an analysis of the undue burden uh, on a particular employer to grant um, a number of these exemption requests. So, so this also requires uh, this notion of undue um, hardship requires employers to look at whether a direct threat is posed, risking substantial harm to the health and safety of coworkers in the workplace. And this sort of, you know, gets back to the, the grave danger language that we saw in the ETS that Brent covered earlier on. Um, when exploring whether an a particular employee would pose a direct threat in the workplace, employers are encouraged to think about the duration of that risk, the nature and severity of its harm, the likelihood that that harm will actually occur, 
and then the imminence of that potential harm. So again, you know, all of this kind of coalescing around that notion of whether there's a grave danger um, allowing a particular exemption request to be granted. Um, the the uh, paths for consideration in ad adopting an organizational accommodation process you know, really require employers to think at the outset about you know, how much latitude they're going to be able to, to grant in um, this accommodation um, process, um, whether they, you know, how they will evaluate the support provided by people seeking exemption requests and the nature of their um, scrutiny of those requests, the, the conduct of their interactive process, which really should be you know, open-ended, inquisitive, trying better to understand the medical condition or religious need that causes an employee to request an exemption. We strongly recommend that you work with HR professionals on this. You know, they're very well equipped to have navigated the ADA interactive process previously in other leave contexts or accommodating other disability conditions. Uh, and likewise, some may have had some experience um, evaluating religious requests relating to holidays or um, you know, work attire or um, breaks from work, those sorts of things, but leverage the expertise that you have in-house and, and get the expertise that you need um, through your Office of General Counsel or other uh, legal counsel as you construct your project and program and as you roll it out and consider these requests one by one. Uh, they really do need to be considered one by one. The evaluation of undue hardship really should be considered on an individualized basis as well and may relate um, integrally to where these people work, what they do, what their role is, and with whom they're coming into contact. Um, you also want to be thinking about you know, preparing for the consequences of, um, of accommodating folks who uh, may need an exemption um, request granted. And those accommodations can include things like masking, social distancing, frequent testing, uh, which we've talked about a bit in the context of the ETS, um, a um, uh, you know safe environment in, within the workplace or continued remote work in certain contexts, modified shifts, reassignments to other roles, and we encourage employers to periodically review whether the decisions that they've made continue to make sense um, for the workplace uh, and and continue to um, enhance its safety um, as as these programs move forward. And to the extent that an employer determines in a particular instance that no reasonable accommodation is possible um, in a particular role, um, we encourage employers to consider whether temporary job alteration or transfer is possible, uh, whether a leave of absence is necessary. And in some cases, especially when uh, it is determined that an employee doesn't pose a legitimate request for exemption and hasn't adequately supported um, that request with medical documentation from a healthcare provider that expresses a contraindication, for example, or um, establishes the sincerely held religious belief that an employer would need to rely on um, to grant an exemption under these federal principles, um, you know, uh, separation from employment may become a consequence that employers need to be thinking through. Um, we've talked about, you know, constructing these programs with an eye toward the volume of requests that you're likely to see. It is certainly true that employers may construct a different process if they see tens of thousands or hundreds of these requests versus a small employer, um, even one who's a large employer subject to the ETS, but who has only 10 requests coming in from employees on a medical or disability uh, or religious uh, exemption request. Um, you know, volume will matter in terms of the structure of the program that you roll out, but the uh, need for interactive uh, engagement with employees on these issues won't change. Um, the, the company mission or ethos will also govern how um, you roll out a program of this sort, how you accommodate these requests. And so someone, an employer working in healthcare might uh, adopt principles for accommodation differently. Um, than an employer who's in a different industry. And uh, whether you can continue to allow remote work, um, even as, as many employers are trying to bring people back into the workplace and maintain engagement through in-person contact, um, that too is likely to drive some of the thought process around accommodations and preparing for consequences. The other, you know, it's, it's worth noting that we are well aware that in many industries that are now subject to these vaccine mandates, 
um, you know, they are struggling with staffing concerns and that's sort of on both sides. People are concerned about issuing a mandate that might be unpopular and cause people to up and resign as a result of the employer asking them to be vaccinated. We're also concerned on the flip side though, about folks who may, um, or industries where, including in healthcare, where you, you might find that there are productivity concerns that um, warrant or justify an employer's um, vigorous enforcement of these federal mandates. Um, and because there's concern that the spreading of the, of the virus within the workplace could lead to productivity challenges when people need to be sent home sick and quarantine and, and so forth. Um, the EEOC has issued recent guidance relating to how to navigate the thorny, tricky um, religious accommodation um, process. And that guidance was just updated several weeks ago, but um, you know, makes clear that um, credibility of employees submitting such requests and um, acting in a manner consistent with their professed beliefs are factors that can be considered when evaluating religious accommodation requests. Um, and it also discusses the nature of undue hardship, incorporating concepts of workplace safety, um, diminished efficiency, and uh, you know the need for others in the workplace, vaccinated folks in the workplace carrying the burden for unvaccinated workers in the workplace. So as we commended to you the FAQs under the ETS, we would commend to you the EEOC guidance, which recently has been updated in this um, area to, uh, at, you know, as you consider your um, accommodation process on both the medical and religious side. Before we end, I want to read the, um, the CLE, which is 7 SS, as in Cypher Shaw, SS 7388. That's SS 7388. And just note for y'all that there are five states, six states now, in which legislation has been passed. Um, sort of challenging a, the right of a, an employer to um, discriminate against or ask about or mandate vaccination. So as we are watching the Fifth Circuit and watching um, the ETS uh, challenges unfold, we are aware that there may be a, a point at which state law, um, you know, it becomes an issue for employers as they're trying to navigate uh, these federal standards. But for now, um, we advise you to get get moving and um, and reach out to your cipher attorney if you need help in constructing an accommodation program uh, that will comply with the particulars that you as an employer need to need to hit for compliance purposes. And with that, we'll close. We see there are lots of questions. We'll attempt to answer those uh, following the program, but we appreciate your participation very much and look forward to seeing you on the next Cypherth webinar. Thanks very much. This concludes Thanks, today's, webinar. today's webinar. Thank you for attending.